Hello and welcome back to another episode of Tuba People TV, where we talk about Arnold Jacobs all of the time. Um, Puddles is uh, uh, taking a little hiatus. He's taking another nap, and so he's not with us. I'm in the studio with uh, Professor Rex Martin. <laughs> this is going to be a blooper reel, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> Rex is a, a, a professor of tuba and euphonium here at Northwestern University. Um, Rex and I were in school together here at Northwestern some many years ago. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say 32, 30, I graduated 30 years ago. Yeah, this month. so 30 years ago. It was a while. And um, I've always had such great respect for you as an artist. You know, just a wonderful uh, musician. Thanks. Man. And uh, uh, Rex also um, was the first call substitute for Mr. Jacobs for a number of years in the Chicago Symphony, as well as you um, did a year down in St. Louis, right? Two years. Two years down in yeah. St. Louis, yeah. and uh, sometime in the Baltimore Symphony in between their two lists uh, back in 1983. Yep. Yeah, and, so, and of course, uh, Rex is all over the world uh, teaching and performing. So uh, thanks, for, thanks for joining us, Rex. Thanks, it's, Mike. it's really Good great to see you. Again. Yeah, we were having lunch earlier, and it's just great to connect with you again. Yeah. I'm wondering, uh, can you uh, just recount the first time that you encountered Mr. Jacobs? You were, I know that you were down at Illinois State with Mr. Livingston, yeah. and just maybe... I was. I was at Illinois State beginning the fall of 1978, and the first time I met Mr. Jacobs, the Chicago Symphony had come there on tour as part of their yearly downstate tours, and there they came with... Uh, Eric Leinsdorf conducting mm -hmm. the full orchestra and all the principals were there and they did a big program including Till Eulenspiegel and uh, I think La Mer and La Valse were on there and some mm -hmm. nice tuba work yeah. and I met Arnold Jacobs afterwards and I, I still have the memory of seeing him coming out you know outside uh, after the after the concert with Bud Herseth and of course when you're 18 years old anyone of that generation they all look alike and mm -hmm. I thought well, these guys could be brothers and it wasn't until years later that I really thought yeah, they don't look much alike. But at, at that time, I really thought they did. And I met him, and he was very gracious, of course, as he always was with everybody. Uh, and then my first lesson wasn't until, I think, a year or two later. It was either, it was the winter of 79, 80. So it was either late 79 or early 1980 I had my first lesson with him. So you drove up from uh, Illinois State? Yeah. Ed Livingston actually set up the first lesson. He had oh. studied with, with Arnold Jacobs. And at that point... Uh, Mr. Livingston had said, Rex, I've kind of run out of things to teach you. I think you should go up and see Mr. Jacobs. And he called. And I didn't know at that point just what a great honor he had done for me. Because mm -hmm. I've talked with so many other students of, of Mr. Jacobs that called for weeks and weeks, weeks or even months before they could yeah. ever get a lesson lined up. And uh, Ed Livingston just called. And I got a lesson a week later. And that lesson changed my life. That is pretty much an, an anomaly. That didn't happen. Yeah, and I thought that yeah. was... You know, I'm, I'm, I mean, that's the standard that normal way. way. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the normal way for everybody else. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for Jake, it was. Yeah. yeah, and I thought that was just the way the lessons got lined up. But, yeah. And I was glad he called for me, because otherwise I wouldn't have gotten the lesson. No, you would have been on the. Call me again next week. Yeah, yeah. call me on Sunday, late afternoon. Yeah. Uh, where's the house? Uh, or where, was your first lesson at his house, or was it at the Fine Arts Building? It was at the Fine Arts Building, okay. and I think he probably hadn't been there all that long at that point, because it seemed pretty tidy at the time. <laughs> yes, the, the white glove test was... <laughs> the tape recorder still worked. The tape recorder still <laughs> yeah, worked, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, it looked pretty, pretty, pretty new. I don't know what year he moved into there, but I visited him, I visited him once at the Normal Avenue mm -hmm. house, and then I did have several lessons at the Maplewood house, but most of us, the first lessons mostly were at the, the Fine Arts Building. Any memories from the Maplewood and Normal Houses? That, uh... The Normal House, not really, because I went there to help him pick up some stuff yeah. and move, because okay. he was moving to the Maple House. house. Yeah. And at that point, you know, we become, it was still very much a, a teacher-student relationship, but it was also, you'd call if you wanted me to just help out some stuff, so I was helping him move boxes. Yeah. And I remember it was full, and he said, yeah, we're pretty much moved out, and it looked like it was so full that it looked like no one had moved anything out of the house yet. Yeah. Um, the, yeah. the Maplewood house, I remember when he moved in, it was a really nice little bungalow and it was very tidy and very clean. He was very happy to be moving into what he considered to be a nicer neighborhood because yeah. he had a policeman living on one side and a fireman on the other. And he thought mm -hmm. this was a very stable neighborhood because his other neighborhood had become a little less safe 
and both of them had had, had, had trouble, uh, including his wife, I think, was, was mugged in, the, in front of their own house. Oh, really? <clears throat> on normal. Okay. Which is the reason why they went, yeah. went to another place. And at that point, he was the only member of the Chicago Symphony that lived south mm -hmm. of Orchestra Hall. And he lived as far south as you could be and still be in the city of Chicago. Yes. Yeah, I, I remember Debbie Overshell mentioning that. Yeah. Says, yeah, nobody lived down there. Yeah. And, and he moved, was from there. And he moved farther south. Yeah, quite a bit. Maybe almost almost twice as far. Yeah. 117 south. It's, it's a block or two later and you're in Blue Island. Yeah. But his wife had grown up in the Normal Avenue house. And so at that point his mother-in-law was still living. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was her childhood home. And she didn't want to move out, move away, and then didn't want to have any part of moving to the north side. So they moved even further south. Mm -hmm. so, but I do remember the, the the Maplewood house, and remember having many lessons down there and liking it. Yeah, you know, liking going down there. But it was also considerably closer for me coming up from Normal to go to that house. This is true. All the way downtown. Right. Yeah. yeah. Rex, I'm wondering if you can uh, recount uh, those initial lessons. What uh, it seems to me, you know, when we first met um, here uh, in Northwestern, what a wonderful artist already. You know, mm -hmm. fairly problem free. You know, unlike myself, who had <laughs> probably every problem in the book, you uh, so musical, so artistically centered. What what did Jake work on with you? Well, it's, it's interesting. Um, I don't really want to come across as being really, you know, problem for a year or anything, because I wasn't, I don't think anyone is, but I didn't really have any pronounced issues. I, I could play the tuba, I could play well, and I could express what I wanted to do, and I think I was a pretty advanced player for the age, but I can remember the first lesson quite, quite clearly, and that I played for him, and in my own naivete, I really thought that this lesson was going to be all about, okay, what do I need to do to begin working in Chicago, mm -hmm. and not about, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I was pretty polished player, and even though I was, I was very, very young at that time, I was still, I think, 19 when I had my first lesson, um, and I played some very advanced trumpet etudes and some pretty flashy literature. Mm -hmm. I still remember the pieces I played, and I, I finished one, and he said, oh, that sounds wonderful. Do you have anything else prepared? And I played something else, and at the end I played three or four pretty long form pieces before he began to be rather effusive in his praise. And I thought, okay, here it comes, right? He, he likes my playing, and mm -hmm. I, I obviously must have liked my own playing pretty much at that time. Uh -huh. um, and he just was filled with praise, like I never heard, right? Uh -huh. And I'm not thinking, okay, when does the hammer fall? Uh -huh. <laughs> but at the end of all this praise, and he told me I had more technique than anybody had ever heard, and I'm ready to play, and blah, 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 blah. But let's work on your sound. Oh. Uh -huh. And I thought, really? I, I I thought I had a nice sound. I truly thought I had a nice sound. People told me I had a nice sound. Um, I believed them. Right? Well, you did have a nice sound. And so he could tell I had kind of a quizzical look on my face. And he said, well, let me have your horn. And so he, of course, took my horn. And after several attempts to put his mouthpiece into my lead pipe, after first poking it into the bell, <laughs> he, he got it into the lead pipe. And he played four or five notes on yeah. my horn that I can still hear to this day and that changed my life. And I immediately, in that moment, thought, yes, I've come to the right place, let's work on my sound, because I want to sound like you. Mm -hmm. I want to sound like that. I'd never heard a sound like that, and I'm still trying to this day to sound like that. Just an so, amazing tone. Yep, I'd never heard anything like that yeah. from a tuba, because it didn't sound like a tuba. It sounded like a human voice, and the utmost clarity. I've never heard that kind of clarity from another brass player. Because, you know, as years later, towards the end of his career, he had a lot of struggles, and he wasn't playing like himself anymore, and he was missing a lot of notes, uncharacteristically, he was missing a lot of notes. And the notes he would miss, I think other people would just love to sound that good, <laughs> because mm -hmm. it still had the same gorgeous clarity as his other notes. There was no difference in that sound. Um, but the initial lessons were about two things. The, the, the initial lesson which of course, like everybody's lesson, lasted maximum one hour. Mm -hmm. And it gave me enough material that I didn't take another lesson for four or five months. Because I, I needed, in my mind, I needed to master what he told me I had to master. And it was mastering two things, that tone quality and a highest, the highest standard of excellence for everything he wanted me to play. That I couldn't play a slur 
unless it was going to be truly excellent. You can't have an articulation unless it's excellent. And he would demonstrate that. And I don't know what he thought, if I would be coming in for a lesson next week or whatever, but he, he assigned, I don't know what the numbers are, you would know better, Mike, the two etudes that we all had to learn from the Cope Rosh, it's either 19 and 20 mm-hmm. or 20 and 21. Mm-hmm. That bum, yeah. bum, 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 yep. bum, bum, and the bum. And I would do those two every day until they, in my mind, until they were as good as I could possibly play. Mm-hmm. And the, the slower, slower of the two, I would play it until it was perfect. And if I got to two bars from the end and had a bad attack or a messy slur, I'd go back to the top. And even at, even if I played it perfectly the first time through, that's about a 15-minute etude. Mm-hmm. We played it really, really slowly. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't get that right off the bat. And so it was four months, maybe even five or six months before I went back for a second lesson. Mm-hmm. And he remembered me, and I played some more things. And uh, I remember that going really well. And at that point, he was already encouraging me to come up and study with him more regularly and to come and roll at Northwestern and to, and to audition for Civic. Mm-hmm. So I did and auditioned for Civic. And also in those days, his lessons, probably when you began as well, were $40. And it, was mm-hmm. a, it was a different rate. It was $40 for tuba players and 50 for non-tuba players. That's right. That's right. So if you didn't like your tuba playing, you maybe also charged you 50 bucks. I don't know. But uh, So they were $40, but it was $40 I didn't have readily. So it, it I had to wait and save quite a while before I could even take another lesson. Yeah. But I also hadn't worked out the initial things enough to really warrant getting the new information. Um, but then I, that fall, next fall I auditioned for Civic and got in <clears throat> and then got Civic lessons. The lessons were then paid through Civic so I could take them more regularly and started getting them, believe it or not, every week. Mm-hmm. I mean, for people of our generation, to the idea of getting a lesson with them every week was and he just, it was yeah. unheard of yeah. because of his health problems and whatnot. Right. But uh, right. I even got two lessons a week. I had a lesson every week that was sort of a normal lesson where we'd work on literature. It was almost strictly working on tone quality and literature. We we work mostly orchestra literature, but some etude material and a lot of trumpet etudes, real kind of top tones and Charlie etudes we worked on together. Um, but then I had an extra lesson every week working on orchestra literature civic. Yeah. through civic. So, and those were not like a normal lesson. It was get through these pieces and, and show me his insight to almost every entrance of every, every work. Yeah. Um, and never recorded a lesson and would finish every lesson and go outside. And I imagine everybody that ever had a lesson with them had the same experience. You'd leave and your head's spinning and you don't know what to think. You don't yeah. know what just happened. You just know you're playing better than you've ever played. Yep. And little by little, all the catchphrases would come back because he knew exactly what he was doing. He was a master at teaching, a master psychologist, and he would give you enough familiarity, something that would rhyme or something that would stick in your mind that was exactly the concept that you needed. And yeah. it would stick, and I didn't even need to write much down. It's still there to this day, most of what I, what I really thought I needed the most or what he thought I needed the most. Yeah. But those initial lessons were like that, and they continued like that. My subsequent lessons, and I didn't actually... Strangely, as much as he's this major towering force in my life, I didn't have all that many lessons. You know, I had steady lessons for a couple of years, and then off and on a few lessons here and there for the next years, because I would want more lessons, and he'd say, no, 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 you don't need a lesson with me. You're getting a lesson every day from Eddie and Bud. And yeah. Just enjoy the I remember lessons. you saying that in, back in the day. Yeah, yeah and I yeah. got lessons, because every time I had a lesson, I'd learn something new yeah. and, and, and be playing better. But I think that he also needed some free time. But I, the later lessons were very different. He'd kind of run out of things to, to teach. And we, we would go there and we would talk, we would chat. And I became kind of a guinea pig if people had sent him various devices and things. He'd say, here, Rex, you try this. Or we'd work on different horns that people had sent him. And I was kind of his surrogate because he wasn't playing very much at that point. And at that point, I think I had been a really good student. And I... I had been able to capture his sound, and I had been able to play just the way he wanted me to play. Mm-hmm. So if he wanted to experiment with something himself but didn't feel comfortable playing it, he'd have me do it. And it was kind of like him living vicariously through my playing through a 20- or 22-year-old. Yeah, so you would uh, you would actually you would come to the end of the rainbow, in a way, you'd, or the, the Yellow Brick Road. You'd, yeah. You'd gotten to the Emerald City. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I thought, and I think I did it fairly quickly. And uh, 
um, he then and he had some some really nice things to say about that. that he, I don't think uh, we had talked earlier off camera that he really hadn't had that many really great students because he was only drawing students from Illinois and from this area, and that's not a lot of people to draw from to begin with. And he wasn't teaching very often or very much through Northwestern. So to have somebody that came in that was that, I think probably that un, unhealthily motivated was not something that, that he had seen very often. Mm -hmm. That was really interesting about your initial lessons and your subsequent lessons, your time with CSO. Do you remember what your last lesson was like? Yeah, I do. It, it, was a, it was quite a special experience for me because unlike all my other lessons, well, for one, about probably seven or eight years had passed between the, what I thought was probably going to be my last lesson and what ended up being my last lesson. We saw each other a lot. We socialized quite frequently. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd talk on the phone all the time, and he came and gave a series of master classes every year there at Northwestern, mm -hmm. and I would take, as he would say, copious notes. Uh, I would fill, in those five days, I would fill 50 or 60 pages of, of, of notes every year, uh, but I didn't take any direct lessons. And Roger Bobo had invited me to uh, play at his uh, international tuba conference in Riva del Garda, Italy, in the summer of 1977, or sorry, dating ourselves, in the summer of 1997, whatever it was. Um, and so I went and played a solo recital, which went very, very well, and several former students and friends of Jake's were in the audience wow. and called him to tell him what a great representative he had in me. Mm -hmm. that here I was traveling the world at that point and playing pretty frequently overseas, playing recitals and mm -hmm. concerts, and that I was such a good representative for his way of playing, his way of thinking more importantly perhaps, mm -hmm. and his sound. And this really piqued Jake's interest. Really? Like, well, I haven't heard Rex play solos in so long. If people are thinking he's my representative, I want to hear what he's doing. <laughs> and I want to hear just what they are attributing yeah, back, back, right. back to him. Right? So, so he called me to schedule the last lesson. So this is the last year before he uh, passed away. Yeah, it was, and it would have been the fall of 97, so a year before he died. And he called me, and we were, and we, again, we chat anyway, but he called specifically saying, if I asked me if I would come down to a studio and bring my F tuba or my E flat and uh, and play for him the solos I'd played in Italy because he'd heard so many things about it. Wow. And, and imagine him wanting to hear solo literature anyway, which he never wanted to hear in yeah. lessons. Um, and so I brought down both my F and the E flat and started to play through all this, for me anyway, it was relatively virtuosic music. And uh, at one point he stops me. I've been playing. A Bottasini string bass concerto on the F tuba. The one that you is that the one that you recorded? Mm -hmm. I haven't recorded it. Okay. There's some recordings floating around. Okay. There, I think, but uh, the one that's on my uh, the, the live CD is a cello sonata. Oh. The okay. Brahms cello sonata. It's probably what you're thinking of. Yeah. Um, but this Bottasini is kind of wild, you know, kind of virtuosic, a lot of fancy stuff. And I'm playing it on the. I'd already played something for him on the E flat. He loved my E flat tuba and mm -hmm. just loved, you know hearing it and loved playing it himself, and uh, he stops me in the middle of this body scene and says, why are you playing this on your F tuba? You sound so much better on your E flat. Hmm. And I said, well, let me turn the page and I'll show you. There's this cadenza that just, I wouldn't even want to look at it on my E flat tuba. It was just really too crazy. So I played that for him, and quickly he tired of hearing solo literature, as he always did, and said, you know, did you bring your C tuba? <laughs> of course, I'd already slept two tubas down there. I didn't bring the C tuba. Yeah. I said, no, Mr. James, I didn't. And he said, well, there's one over there in the corner. We'll pick that up. And the next 45 minutes, it was an audition where he played. He asked me to play one orchestra part after another from memory, mm -hmm. just seeing have I been a good boy. And that was the whole lesson was just, let's hear a little of this, and let's hear a little of that, and could you play a bit of this? And there were some fairly obscure things, but things that he knew that we'd worked on yeah. together. Wow. And all from memory, and, and at the end of it all, he said, you're doing fine. You know, and he really liked what I'd been doing. And, and I'd never played the Hindemith Sonata for him, ever yeah. in lessons, because we didn't work on, you know, we, we had never really worked on solo pieces much. And so I asked him, I said, would you mind if I played a little bit of that for you? Because I've never played it, and I'd love to get your insight. And he said, of course. So I played through the entire piece, and he hadn't taught me anything the entire lesson at this point, right? 
And we finish up, and he turns to something in the third moment. He says, do you think you might have been forcing there a bit? <laughs> and I think I probably was. <laughs> Let's hear it again. <laughs> and of course, it was so much better. Just that one little phrase. Yeah. And that stayed with me. And at the end of that lesson, it really felt truly like closing the book on a... Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that I mean that was a that was a really great time for you. I mean, yeah. that affirmation. Yeah, and that was an interesting thing to feel that that affirmation. But I think un, unlike you know he he wasn't very effusive in his praise. If he ever praised you for anything, you could take it seriously because yes. he really truly meant it. And occasionally, you know, he'd be so animated when you play something well. It was really pretty fun. Yeah. But he had been giving me such accolades through all those years. But that one was maybe the most poignant for me because yeah. it really felt like we'd close the book on such an important part of my life. It didn't seem like, now, looking back, it doesn't seem like a very long period of my life. I knew him for about 18 years or so, 18 mm -hmm. or 19 years. Mm -hmm. um, but looking back, it was a relatively short period. But at the time, it seemed like I'd known him forever. You know, he, he, he was always about excellence. Mm -hmm. Always about excellence. Always about, uh, about um, the high standard, yeah. you know? Yeah, I'd say that for me probably represents one of the two most important things I learned from him, or maybe the three. The three things that come to mind that seems odd to think you would understand it very, very well, or any of his students would understand well, but he taught me how to think mm -hmm. more than anything. M much more than how to play, he taught me how to think. And he taught me tone quality and the importance of tone quality that I now think of that as just simply one more part of my technique that is, is a part of the technique but it's a very important part of our technique that, yeah. that tone but perhaps the most important thing of all that he showed me was that there was a higher standard possible a higher standard of excellence than I had ever dreamt of mm -hmm. I had never been exposed to that by any brass players I just didn't know anybody that that absolutely hewed to the highest standards possible. And I thought I had been. You know, I was always trying to play better every day, and every day trying to get better at this and better at that. But he showed me a level of excellence that I didn't know existed. Mm -hmm. And he pushed me to a level of excellence that I never, ever could have done on my own. There's many, many things, and in fact, it's something you would know very, very well, Mike. Perhaps the biggest failing, one of the biggest failings, and you know, I've thought a lot about this with his teaching, but maybe the biggest failing of all is that he assumed everybody would work as hard as they needed to work. Mm. And he wouldn't push them. When it comes to basic technique, anybody can learn that without a teacher. You don't need a teacher if you can just push yourself to do that. Mm -hmm. And so very often his students would be able to do beautifully the things they'd worked on in lessons and very little else. Mm -hmm. A lot of his mm -hmm. students... And some other teachers I've known that had a similar philosophy, they'd often have a gorgeous sound and no technique. Not enough chops to play the orchestra literature and certainly not enough to play the solo literature. And often not enough to even work professionally. Yeah. Because the tone quality was what he was focused on and the high standards of that. Yeah. But, so I think that is a bit of a failing. But the one thing that he did bring for me was above all else was that this is a standard of excellence that comes from one man and it didn't come from him it came from Adolf Hersa the mm -hmm. first for, former first trumpet player of the Chicago Symphony and that I think is basically the root of all of Jake's teaching and Jake's teaching changed a lot and he explained to me because it happened mostly before before I was born mm -hmm. or shortly after we were born mm -hmm. we were the same age <laughs> um, I'm a little older one sees that. <laughs> Zing! In fact, I believe it's about three months. And it is three months. See that. It is three months. Yeah. Three months off. White marks. <laughs> three months off. That, that little little line right there. Um, no. We're we're on Earth. Am I at this point? Are we talking about Bud or something? His excellence. Yes. <laughs> well, Jake earlier had a very different approach to teaching from what he explained to me that because of his love of physiology and his studying, wanting to become a medical doctor, and at one point, or more than one point, was seriously considering leaving the Chicago Symphony to go to medical school. Right, right. And in these studies, that was then informing him in how to teach. And he was teaching very much from this physiological point of view. If you can just figure out how to do it, 
you'll be able to play. So yeah, and a so, system or a method. Yeah, right. And basically, physically, you got to be doing things correctly. And he was teaching that, and he said he was just turning his students into knots. He said they couldn't play. And one day he was talking with Bud Herseth, going up the steps on up on the stage, and he said, Bud, tell me, what is it you think about while you're playing? And I think Bud never thought about that. He looked at Jake and said, Well, I just think about how it goes. And Jake said, Oh, you think about how it goes. Okay, but in that moment when you're actually playing that note, what are you thinking about? He said, Well, just think about how it goes. And Jake said, Yeah, yeah, you're thinking how it goes, but like in that moment, right then when you're playing that passage, what is it that's going on in your mind? He said, Damn it, Jake, I think about how it goes. And he walked away. Mm -hmm. And Jake went downstairs and wrote that down. And I think from that moment, a light went on in his head where he shifted from the physiological approach to teaching to trying to find the psychological controls of how to control that. And yeah. that's what, and then we were the beneficiaries of that. Yeah. So he did teach his students very, very well from that point of view, but that came from Bud. But then this idea of standards also came from, from Bud, from, Herson, from Mr. Herseth. And I have a feeling that until Adolf Herseth joined the Chicago Symphony, I, my feeling is Jake had never heard another brass player at his own level. He'd probably never heard anybody yeah. that had such easy, complete command right. of whatever he wanted to do. Whatever he wanted to come out of that horn was going to come out of that horn. And he'd never, I don't think he'd been exposed to anybody else that could do that. And suddenly, there he was. His kindred spirit. I don't think so. I think his new idol, well, his mentor as a younger man yeah. than him, and I think he knew it immediately from the way he talked about it, that he said from the very first rehearsal, his words were, where did you find this angel? He never heard anything like that. And he spent the rest of his life, well, let me back up one, one by one. Herseth spent his entire life beating Herseth. Mm -hmm. That's just what he did. Adolf Herseth was going to be Adolf Herseth, and that's, that was his job in life. Yeah. And Jake's job was to try to get everybody else to be like that. And I think that's, again, we were the beneficiaries yeah. of that. And that standard of excellence wasn't just his own. Jake was also trying for that level, but he was trying for the level of Bud. And always trying to get better. And, and Jake's son, Dallas, told yeah. me that he'd sometimes come home from work and he'd be so upset. Oh, I missed that note so badly. Why doesn't that ever happen to her? You know, he just was frustrated in that yeah. until he realized, okay, it's all about how you think. And he changed the way he would think about things and he changed the way his teaching was oriented to show his students that, yeah, if you think like this, if you think about, I just think about how it goes. Yeah, right? Mm-hmm. And that will then take care of it. And I think it's actually true. And that, that excellence is maybe perhaps the most important thing I learned from him. But it comes indirectly from Bud. That's great. I mean, uh, that's such great information, and a great insight, mm -hmm. yeah, great thought. When do you suppose uh, they had that little seminal stage conversation? He told me it was sometime in the mid 50s. Okay. So, her so he had been doing the experiments him. in the early 50s. Yep. And and he continued those on into the early 60s, yeah. in fact, at the University of Chicago with all the, the breathing yeah. things, yeah. which I'm really glad he did that because it gave us the scientific basis for, yes, this is in fact true. He, he moved, he moved teaching out of the uh, subjective into the objective, yeah. out of the anecdotal into the empirical. Exactly, and, and was able to explain, look, a lot of what we teach in music, in fact, maybe most of what we're teaching in the art form, that's just, that those are opinions. Yes. But this part, the physiological part, this are simple facts. Right. You can't argue with this because people in, in medical school have been learning this on the first day for a couple hundred years. There's nothing unusual here. And it took it out of that realm of there having any personality or any, any uh, basis for dispute. Yeah. For it's just simply the way things function. Yeah. And that's actually, that was a great service to the rest of us. That, yeah. That it is something that everyone should know. I agree. That's great. Rex, I mean, you've you played with the CSO for many years um, as a substitute for Mr. Jacobs, mm -hmm. uh, with Mr. Jacobs. What was it like to play with, with Jake? It was a real joy. Um, I can't, but strangely, I don't know why it's not coming to mind. I don't remember the first time I played with him. Um, although I think it was playing Zarathustra with him. Um, 
because I, I think I did all the major two tuba works with him. Mm -hmm. Some of them I did as first tuba and somebody else was playing second, but a lot of them I got to play with him. Did uh, Rite of Spring several times, mm -hmm. uh, like all the Strauss tone poems that had two tubas got to do. And then interestingly, the later years of his life, we were playing nearly any concert. I was playing most of the concerts in a given year, um, but whenever he was feeling healthy enough to come in and play, he would have me be on stage as well and we would actually play using two tubas on the parts that only called for one. And mm -hmm. that was really a joy, a, a lot of fun to do that. Um, but I have so many memories, some vivid, some just kind of blurry, of just what it was like to be on stage with him. If you can remember, of course you can, mm -hmm. anybody that ever heard a Chicago Symphony concert in those 50 years would remember his opening uh, Concert, pre concert his, warm up. His warm up, oh, yeah. Which right. would be a series of cadenzas, uh -huh. and people would want to get there early just to listen to him play. Yep. And it was a joy to be on stage, not just to be out there as he's doing it, but to be encouraged to be doing it myself. Come on, do a bit of that. Let him hear what you can do with that. Yeah. You know, and just, yeah. I remember in particular, he could be pretty competitive when it came to other tuba players. Yeah. Um, and he was so gracious and such a gentleman in his public face. But as a friend, like, he let me know pretty clearly what he thought of different players, you know, different big names around the world, and right. who he liked and who he didn't. And he did like a lot of them, by the way. Um, but when we were once in a, in a, in a major city, and he, he thought, he didn't think highly of the way they played in that town, mm -hmm. like the way they played brass instruments, not just the tuba. And so he wasn't really at the top of his game anymore. And so he's sitting next to me, feeding me information. Of, now play a D in the staff, just loud, let it ring. Not everybody could do that, you know. Uh -huh. and, this, and just play some things like that. And now do a little of your triple tiny. You're awfully good at that. You know, and like just blank, blank, blank. And for 20 minutes, he's like being the brain uh -huh. for my lips as I'm playing. And that was really a lot of fun. Oh, that's interesting. But then, and so it was like being told how to do his, his little routine, his little warm-up, right? right? Which was, a lot of it was just to get him in mental shape for what he was going to do, a little bit probably for being a little bit in physical shape for doing it. And mostly he would do that, by the way, on days when he'd been teaching a lot yeah. to get the focus back. Um, but then part of it was just simply to show off. Mm -hmm. It was just to show off and to get your performer's hat on. Yeah, right? put the performer's hat on. Yeah, because he'd been a full day of teaching in the studio. Yeah. And he said that was the biggest danger of that. He said he always knew when he and Ed Kleinhammer were uh, teaching too much in a day mm -hmm. because they would tend to fall asleep on stage. They'd <laughs> 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 get really, really, really tired. Um, but in general, playing with him was a real joy because that's who I wanted to sound like anyway, you know, even if I, if I were by myself. And there's my model and my mm -hmm. role model right there next to me to kind of guide me. And it was quite a, a great learning experience. In fact, those, all those concerts, more than a thousand concerts I played with the Chicago Symphony in those seven years where I played mostly, most of those concerts for seven years, I treat it now as that was the greatest apprenticeship that a man could ever have. That was the greatest learning experience. It was, you know, mm -hmm. earn, earn as you learn. Well, yeah, I mean, and plus getting to play, uh, even whether it was a, a legitimate second tuba part or you were you were doubling on the, the one tuba part, getting to hear Jacobs, getting to hear uh, Hersath, Chris Foley, Kleinhammer, Dale, uh, these uh, this 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 whole concept of stage makeup. Yeah. You know, just hearing the hearing that that unvarnished sound because the hall varnishes the sound. Yeah. What was that like? It does. That was really. It, it was so natural to have never even seemed like it was a part of my education. It was just when you're surrounded by people playing where 100% of that brass section had the same idea. Hmm. Everybody was going after that same concept, the same basic approach to playing. Some could call it a cookie cutter approach to playing, but I just thought it was the way to play. And hmm. everyone was doing it. Um, and when everyone is doing that, you just naturally do it yourself. You just fall into that. Um, and so it never really seemed odd to me. It was like, okay, this is what you have to do, right? And it was, this is what you have to do rhythmically, including if this is the downbeat, you come in here, pow! Mm -hmm. Long before you actually see it hit right. the ground, people were already coming in. That's, that doesn't work in every orchestra. It doesn't work now. I think that that orchestra's already changed quite a bit. It no longer has that jumping in early kind yeah. of approach. Yeah. 
Um, but it also, maybe the most important thing of that approach is that that level of self-confidence is like a virus that just spreads to everybody. And everybody was so self-confident that you just assumed that everything was going to be good. Mm -hmm. It was going to be what you thought it was because it is all the time, right? And when everybody's that confident, it's pretty easy to have that sense of confidence as well. Yeah. I remember when we were in school, and after you graduated, I was still completing my uh, my undergraduate, even though I am older than you. It's you kind were of held funny back, that. Don't you? Well, I wasn't held back. I, I transferred a couple of times. I was in search of perfection, of excellence. That's, That's what we I, all are still. <laughs> exactly right. But I remember uh, having conversations with you um, here in Regenstein uh, about Mr. Kleinhammer. And it, and it really struck me that you had an extra special friendship yeah. with Mr. Kleinhammer. I, would you care to... I would, I would, because I, 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 I think the world of it. Yeah. And he's a dear friend, and still is. Although, sadly, we don't have very much contact anymore. For three years, we were like... If you could imagine like the concept of old buddies, like old comrades or fishing buddies, we, we never served in the war together, we never went fishing together, but we had that kind of camaraderie. And it was from day one. The day I met him was my very first day getting to play with the Chicago Symphony. Mm -hmm. and I was in Civic at the time, and it was the week before school started here to begin my master's degree studies. And Jake had a, had a heart problem, mm -hmm. and he called me and another member of the Civic Orchestra to come down to his house and play an audition. Mm -hmm. And we played through all the literature that was going to be needed for the upcoming downstate tour. And I won that audition, so he sent me in to go play. And of course, I'd already, as a member of the Civic Orchestra for a year, I'd been going to the concerts. I knew everybody's names. I, knew, of course, knew all the brass players' names. Right. But right. I knew all the players in the orchestra's names, right? Because these were my, my heroes, right? This everybody in that orchestra. And to walk up, walk up on stage and to see Ed Kleinhammer sitting in the chair next to me was pretty special. And he immediately stood up and introduced himself and gave me a bone-crushing handshake. <laughs> it's probably still misshapen my hand. Um, and said, and I said, it's so nice to meet you, Mr. Kleinhammer. And he immediately said, Mr. Kleinhammer was my father. You're going to call me Ed. Oh, and I said nice. to him, that's like calling God. Ed. Because I'd heard that line in a movie of some sort. Yeah. But that, that, that was the first thing that I just blurted out in my nervousness. And he didn't even think that was funny. It was just, that's my name and you're going to call me Ed, <laughs> right? But then we started chatting and he was very gracious and it was very, very easy just to talk, which he's 40 years older than me. Um, and yet it was as if there was no age barrier, no, no generational barrier, which is common in music, but I didn't know that at that age. I didn't have any friends at my grandparents' age. Um, but then after that first rehearsal, after we actually played together for a day, a couple of rehearsals that day, we became fast friends. And we went out for beers that night, mm -hmm. and we went out for beers on that tour. Mm -hmm. And he, he had a little routine, and he was a real fan. Like he, he loved my playing as much as I loved his. But he had a routine that, depending on how well I played that night, he would say to me, tonight you can have two beers, right? Or if I played exceptionally well, tonight you can have three beers. And I would go out and have three beers, right? And often, if it's on a tour, it would be with that. And I remember the first time I played pictures at an exhibition and played the Beedle. I remember the first night. Um, he said, tonight you can have as many beers as you want. <laughs> 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 That's a great story. That was nice. And he he was a, a big supporter, and I learned an awful lot. I also took some lessons from him. I learned a lot from him. And as much as anything, I learned how to be a musician. And how it's work. Thanks. Sure. You know, we've already talked about, about Bud and Jake and Bud's uh, um, influence on Jake. I'm wondering, you know, in those years that you played with the orchestra, if you have any special memories or you had any special encounters or times with, with Mr. Hersa. Oh, yeah, a lot, many. Um, the first one would probably be, I, you know, I'd met him, but I didn't really know him. And at that age, I couldn't really discern, like, what can I learn from a trumpet player mm. as a tuba player? Now it seems perfectly clear if I hear any instrument or voice or even a drum, I can steal lots of stuff from yeah. these guys. 
But at that point, it's like, well, he plays the trumpet. What can I learn from that? And Jake would always use his name, but you got to play like Herset. you got to play to his standard. And I'm thinking, I don't get it. It really didn't make sense to me. And I remember in Vince Chickowitz's class, you know, in his, I don't remember what he called it. Orchestral rap or, or uh, something. something. Recordings. That was that was Luther's class, was the... Recordings? recordings? Well, no, the, the, the orchestra rep class. So I remember in Vince's class, we would listen to... the recordings where he'd play like yeah. five orchestras playing the same trumpet ones and always finishing with Bud. Yeah. And Bud like making it sound like, well, that's the way it goes. Yeah, <laughs> that's the good one. Yeah. And I could judge trumpets one against the other. I just couldn't learn much from it. But in that class, Vince asked me, because, you know, I'd been playing with the orchestra that year, and he said, well, Rex, can you explain to us the difference between when they play the German trumpets and their Bach piston valve trumpets. And I had to make up a BS answer because I just thought they both sounded like trumpets. Right? Mm-hmm. I, I really, at that point, my ear wasn't in tune to that. My yeah. my head at that point was really in the tuba part at that age. Because right? it was all I could do to, to do my best in that situation. But a few years later, I think I would have had a, a pretty good opinion about it. But that was my first introduction to Herseth. It's just being told that he's better than everybody, period. And it wasn't until years later that I started to really get it and to really understand that, yeah, he is better. And he is by far, in my opinion, I've been lucky. I've been able to work with some of the greatest brass players in the whole world. Yeah. And I know a lot of these guys and really like them and like them as friends and as colleagues. Yeah. But I've got to say that I've not met anybody like Herseth. I've not met anybody with his particular skill set. And his skill set is only partially having to do with playing the trumpet. I think it's a lot of his skill set is his native intelligence, it's his flair for music, it's his his confidence, uh, but it's mostly I think about his uh, sensitivity as a human being, his work ethic as a musician, and his just unbeatable willpower. I've never met another human being with a, a will like Bud Herseth. Mm-hmm. Nothing. I've got, I mean, well, I think all good professional musicians have a strong will, and everybody's pretty strong-willed and pretty hard-headed, but he makes everybody else look like a bunch of ADD children running around. Mm-hmm. Like, he's just that much better than everybody. Yeah. Uh, and I learned that from him, but I had a lot of nice times with him, just conversations, because on these downstate tours, I'm from downstate Illinois, so we went on several downstate tours where I would drive because I'd get to go see my family or go see my friends. And he rode with me several times. So we'd spend oh, really? hours alone in my car mm-hmm. where I tried to maintain uh, steady speed and obey all the limits because I've got precious cargo right in the, in the car. Yeah. Um, and we had a lot of conversations about things that I wouldn't have struck up a conversation about. right? And yeah. he talked about life. He talked about food, and he talked about travel and just nice things, but we'd also talk about music, specific techniques for concentration, specific techniques for counting rests. I learned lots of cool stuff from him, just from these hours sitting in the car. We never socialized a lot. You know, we'd, we'd have wine together, or food on tours once in a while. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we never became close like I was with, with Ed Kleinhammer, but I probably learned more from him in terms of like just that hard-ass, assassin, cold-blooded assassin's approach to play, mm-hmm. more from him than anybody else. And I tried to emulate that, you know, but in terms of musicianship, like, I've never met anybody that had that level of excellence in everything he did. And it comes down to basically two sides of our personality, and we talk about, that as every Arnold Jacobs student, the, the difference between keeping your mind on the product versus getting involved in the process, right? And mm-hmm. trying to stay focused on the product. Another way of looking at that is that the product and the process, you could think of that as you, the artist, and you, the artisan. And a lot of people praise Bud because of the impeccable artisanal abilities he had. Yeah. But in my opinion, those artisanal abilities were all in the service of his artistic, his artistic uh, vision of mm-hmm. what he wanted to communicate to the audience. And I learned that from Jake, but about Bud. And then getting to play all mm-hmm. those concerts with him and some chamber music with him as well, which was really quite special. Yeah. I got that in, in spades. Oh, that's great. Thanks for sharing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He was a very important man in my life. Yeah, I mean, we all studied with him, whether or not we yeah. were in a room with him or just listening to him. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Rex, it's been 15 years since Mr. Jacobs passed away. 
and um, you know, just going forward uh, as a as a teacher, I wonder I wonder what he would think about uh, us as his students uh, in terms of the you know the future. What do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think he'd be. I would hope anyway. I'd hope he'd be proud that his legacy is still continuing and that there's still people like you and people like me and other of our friends that are continuing to teach his basic philosophy. And the basic philosophy is quite, quite simple. It's yes. just that you should sound good. Right. right. It's, it, you you should sound play. great. doesn't matter how. Just no. sound great. And, that, and he always preached that. I think a lot of people misunderstood that. And people that ever had any, and sometimes had some really severe, debilitating physical problems or mental problems in playing, they had to work on real remedial things with him. And he could do that beautifully, better than anyone that I've ever known. Yeah. But they would then think that that's what his teaching was all about. And I think that relatively few of his students really understood what the, the simplicity of what he was trying to say. Mm -hmm. right? and, and, and it is a very, very simple philosophy that you want to sound good. Here are some very efficient ways of going about that. But it's basically about what you're thinking about. If you can control your thoughts, you can control your playing that way. And I think he would be quite proud that we're still teaching in that way. And that his actual tone quality, which had to have been a real rarity before he was teaching. I mean, yeah. he came upon it somehow. I don't know how. I well, I do know how, in fact. I bought the entire entire box set, all the recordings of uh, Toscanini with the Philadelphia Orchestra. Yeah. And it sounds like Arnold Jacobs playing. So Donatelli had that sound. So that's where he would have come up with that clarity. And okay. I don't know where his teacher got it, but that was Jake's sound. Um, and I think he'd be proud that that sound, that actual sound itself, is still continuing. And a lot of his players, or a lot of his students, and their students, and their students, mm -hmm. who never would have met Mr. Jacobs. I think he'd be happy about that. Um, over the years, there were a lot of his students, and I, I sort of alluded to the fact he didn't have a lot of talented students over the years. He wasn't very well known until his later, last couple of uh, decades of his life, I think, mm -hmm. when he became a, a real star, justifiably yeah. so. And he had great students coming from all around the world. But until that point, he was kind of a local music teacher teaching out of his house, right? Mm -hmm. So he didn't have a lot of great students. And sadly, a lot of them would sort of They'd hear him play, and, and they'd be intoxicated by the, the, the bigness of it all, the, the, the show of it all. Mm -hmm. And they'd then copy the idiosyncrasies that he had. And he had a few idiosyncrasies. Yes, he did. He had his own personal approach to rhythm, his own personal <laughs> approach to dotted rhythms in particular. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is sort of very, very old-fashioned, almost sort of a vaudeville approach to Yeah, vaudeville, that's a really great... Uh, yeah, kind of had that. Yeah, that old-fashioned showbiz. Showbiz, approach, yeah. you know, and, and uh, I, I think little by little those guys have kind of been weeded out, and they weren't generally very successful. But you know, the whole exaggerated hand maneuvers and the bouncy mm -hmm. sound and the exaggerated vibrato, which sounded so gorgeous when he did it, and sounded so odd when any of us did it, and we all wanted to do it. But mm -hmm. It sounds odd when someone copies somebody that way. So. I think going into the future, there's something that, that leads me, that guides me on a, on a daily basis, like, like you as well, Mike, and any of the students, that there's not a day goes by when I'm playing or when I'm teaching that I don't think about him, right? And that there's, and he, he gave us so many simple tools of ways of remembering things, either visually or, or orally, with these little slogans that he had, little mm -hmm. catchphrases and whatnot. But the one thing that, that helps me quite a bit is a phrase I heard unrelated to, to music. But the phrase was, don't follow the master. Go where he was going. And I think about that, of going where Arnold Jacobs was going, and that I'm trying to go there, mm -hmm. just like he was. And in many aspects of what we do, we've gone so much further than he ever would have gone. And as he was proud of saying, every generation is better than the last. Right. And it's really true. Yeah. And as Gene Pocorny says, every generation stands on the shoulders of the generation before. And we That's can right. see a little further, and it's true. I, mean, I get high school students auditioning for me, playing things that not only could I not play it at that age, I can't play it now. <laughs> <laughs> but I love that. I actually, yeah. I, I get excited. Uh, that, maybe that's an exaggeration, but 
because I can fake things really well. But um, when I get advanced doctoral students and master's students, yeah. like I do right now, that can do things that I can't do, I actually really love that at many levels. At one level, the competitive side of me loves it because I've got something more to practice and something to, you know, to try to still inspire these guys. I want to be able to do some things better than they do. But just as a proud teacher, I'm thrilled. I'm just thrilled when they do things that I can't do because I just love to sit here and listen to it. Yeah. And think, well, keep going. You know, I'm, I can't do that. I'm not even going to bother. That's just great. Yeah. And I do love that. So, and I learned that from him. Yeah. Because already, you know, as a pretty young guy, I was doing some things that he wasn't able to do, or wasn't, he was no longer able to do, I, I suspect. Right. Um, and he stopped playing in my lessons after the second or third lesson. He just never played for me again, which we, he played at least on stage. I get to hear him play professionally a lot. But yeah. in lessons, he had told me that he would never, ever play in lessons unless he knew he could really play better than that student and really inspire them. Mm -hmm. And so it was always a bit of an inside laugh I would get when mm -hmm. I... You know, some a foreign student would come and take a lesson, and afterwards say, "Oh, that was fabulous! He played for me the whole time." <laughs> oh man, it's a sign that you weren't doing very well, mm -hmm. you know, because he hadn't played for ten years. <laughs> now he's still going to outdo somebody because he still could. You know, right. he could get the power of his thoughts, and the fact that as he was the first to say, "Is it really very hard to play the tuba?" <laughs> you know, nine-year-olds start every year playing the tuba, and sometimes pretty well. Yeah. But if you've got that sense of ease and efficiency and this great concept of what it is you're trying to do, it isn't really all that hard. Well, those, those, are, those are great thoughts. And um, I know that uh, Puddles was, was uh, disappointed on the one hand to miss our time. He was pretty sleepy, though. Yeah. It's been a busy week for him, you know. A bit of jet lag. A bit of jet lag. And some, he's missing some feathers, yeah, from the oh. severe tailwinds. Oh, I thought it was... Because I have noticed that my pillow is a little fluffier and quite comfy. <laughs> but I know that he, he's probably out there playing with some of the ducks out there on Lake Michigan. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah. before he before he left, he did he did instruct They're me to. Bunch. I've noticed that. He did he did instruct me to uh, um, present you with this uh, genuine University of Oregon duck mug, which wow. does have some of the missing feathers. Look at that on the mug. So That's beautiful. We, uh, we we present you with our so sincere. I requested. Are those the school colors? They sometimes are the school colors, yeah. That's beautiful. It depends on the year. So the colors are flexible? They are flexible. Is it sort of based on the Chinese calendar? No, it's based upon our budget, which, uh, because uh, we're... Various already... colors have various price points. Exactly. So last year might have been gold leaf. Could have been, yeah. <laughs> as long as we have feathers. all be sort of terracotta. Yeah. It's seriously, right. Wow. It's exactly. great. It's great to see you. It's been too Thank long. You. It has been. I hope our, our is it, is paths it? cross again soon. Exactly. And I appreciate your your insights and your thoughts. Well, thanks, Mark. I appreciate you coming out. Yeah, it's great. Thanks. And now back to you. Recording. Hey, John Church. Okay, I'm going to tilt this down a little bit. Yeah. Take the glare off my head? No, no. Okay, we're good. No, no? We're good. All right. You know, Rex said it's been uh, 15 years now since Mr. Jake, pa Mr. Jake, let me start that again, here we go. It was kind of you not to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> we were on outtakes.